Hello? Hello? Hello?
A very good morning to each and every one of you present here. I'd like to say welcome to all our family and friends of the Presbyterian Church of Teaneck, wherever you are, comfortably relaxing at home. Welcome to the United Presbyterian Church of Teaneck. Welcome to the United Presbyterian Church of Patterson, I'm sorry. The Emmanuel Presbyterian Church in Indianapolis and our friends and families in all the various locations. As we continue our live streaming through Zoom on today's date, that is August the 8th, which is the 11th Sunday after Pentecost, and it's the 19th Sunday in ordinary time. So with that, we will begin our call to worship. So then, putting away false falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors. Let no, no evil talk come out of our mouths. mouths but only what is useful for building up. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit with which you were marked with a seal. Let us be kind to one another, tender-hearted, and forgive one another. Let us worship God as we sing our opening hymn, To God Be the Glory. Please join me in our prayer of confession and assurance of pardon as we do this responsively. Therefore, we are members of one another, put away falsehood and speak the truth. Forgive us, O God, for we deceive one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Forgive us, O God, since we are prone to hold grudges. Do not steal but work honestly. Make yourselves able to give to those in need. Forgive give us, O God, God, for we squander, squander your mercies and take, take no delight in sharing our needs. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths. Only talk that builds up your neighbor. Forgive give us, O God, God, for we slander one another without being conscious, conscious 
of the destruction we cause. Know that Christ loved us and gave himself for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. If we are sorry and truly repent of our sin, in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory be to the Father. <laughs> At this point in time, I'd like to share just a couple of announcements with you. I think maybe the last Saturday or two Saturdays ago, some of you who were available here to do the Zoom with our Deacon um, Ogbanaya, but if you still, um, I hope you enjoyed that Zooming session and you're more familiar with how to Zoom, but if you still need some more information, you. There's th that bulletin has all the information. You can click, go to the word, how to use the Zoom. There's a video that was prepared by Deacon Ogbanaya. So if you follow the instructions on, this, on your bulletin, you will know how to get there. If not, you can call Ogbanaya and maybe she can follow up with that. Also, if... If you would, if you like Shakespeare, there is still, this month is what? There is still Shakespeare in the park, that's Overpeck Park at the amphitheater. And in your bulletin, all those dates have been printed for Hamlet as well as, as you like it. So you can check on your bulletin and you can go to the Overpeck Park at the amphitheater to enjoy your Shakespeare. Also, I'd like to bring your attention to A notice posted by the Presbyterian Church of Teaneck. Leonia. In Leon. <laughs> oh my, why am I saying Presbyterian yeah. Church of Teaneck all the time? It's Presbyterian Church of Leonia. They'll be having, they'll be hosting an emergency food pop-up food pantry on August the 14th of this year, of course. And if you're interested and you want to make an appointment, please take this number down if you have a pencil and pen with you. Five five one two two five eight zero nine zero. Once again, five five one two two five eight zero nine zero. Where they will be providing food boxes of food, staples, and fresh produce. But you must wear a face covering and be a Bergen County resident, and you have to make that appointment. Once again, it's on Saturday, August the 14th, and you have to make that appointment by August 12th. And the number, once again, 551-225-8090. Also, we have our own Nikichi here singing with us today. And... Um, we would also like to say congratulations for the birth of your child very soon. And with that, we would like to present to you a parting gift, please. <laughs> On behalf of our pastor and 
congregation of Presbyterian Church of Kinev. We wish you joy, we wish you all the blessings, safety, everything that goes well with your pregnancy. Thank you so much. Thank and you. also, so, <laughs> well, I was going to put the the uh, little teddy oh, bear in good. here, it's, 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 but uh, we don't have the stick, so you got to get the stick later to put the teddy yeah. bear in the flowers. But the flowers are for you, yeah. <laughs> and the teddy bear is for you, <laughs> and this is for you. <laughs> Congratulations and our yes. best wishes. Yes, our best wishes to you, you and Les and Daddy too. <laughs> Daddy's back there. Lex is back there. <laughs> Okay. So our scripture lesson readings today will be taken from 2 Samuel chapter 18. 2 Samuel chapter 18 verses 5 through 9. Verses 15 and then verses 31 to 33. And we will continue with Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through chapter, 20, chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. So let's begin with the second Samuel chapter 18, verses 5 through 9. And the king ordered Joab and Abishai and Itai, deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. And all the people heard when the king gave orders to all the commanders about Absalom. So the army went out into the field against Israel and the battle was fought in the forest of Ephraim. And the men of Israel were defeated there by the servants of David. And the slaughter there was great on that day, 20,000 men. The battle spread over the face of all the country and the forest devoured more people that day than the sword. And Absalom chanced to meet the servants of David. Absalom was riding upon his mule and the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak and his head caught fast in the oak and he was left hanging between heaven and earth, while the mule that was under him went on. We will continue with 15. And 10 young men, Joab's armor bearers, surrounded Absalom and struck him and killed him. And then we will proceed to 31 through 33. And behold, the Cushite came and the Cushite said, good tidings for my Lord, the King. For the Lord has delivered you this day from the power of all who rose up against you. The King said to the Cushite, is it well with the young man Absalom? And the Cushite answered, may the enemies of my Lord, the King and all who rise up against you for evil be like that young man. And the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he wept, he said, Oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom. What I had died instead of you, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. We will continue with Ephesians chapter 4. Verses 25. Okay. Therefore, putting away falsehood, let everyone speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his hands so that he may be able to give to those in need. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only such 
as is good for edifying as fits the occasion, that it may impart grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God in whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God and Christ forgive you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us, and give himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. I've got a pop quiz for you today. How many steps does it take to walk around the world? Think about it. Think how many steps it takes you to go from your house to the end of the block. Multiply that by a couple of blocks or more than a couple. <laughs> Multiply that and multiply that and multiply that. How many steps would it take you to go walk around the world? Since we aren't Jesus and we can't walk on water, we're excluding oceans and major bodies of water. Well, there's a website that measures such achievements as walking around the world. According to their calculation, it takes the average person around 20 million steps to make that walk. Can you, can your counter, any kind of, but they have those little, what do you call them, fit, something other, fit whatever, 
that counts steps? Can your little de uh, device register 20 million steps? Or would it melt down after about 10 million? Among the handful of people who have proof that they have completed this walk is Stephen Newman, the first person known to walk solo around the world. It took him four years. The first woman was named Rosie Swell Pope, who at age 57 jogged around the world to raise money for various charities. She wore out 50 pairs of running shoes by the time she completed her run. George Megan holds the record for the longest unbroken walk. He traveled 19,119 miles in 2,425 days. That's six years and eight months. My legs are getting tired just thinking about about what they accomplished. There's a travel company in the United Kingdom called World Walks. They specialize in setting up walking and, and hiking tours all over the world. They hire experienced world travelers and hikers to serve as guides. However, there are a few walks that even their guides won't lead. On their blog, there's a list of the five toughest walks in the world. These hikes are so challenging that you can't even hire a guide for most of them. But you had better not walk them alone because there is such a high risk of injury on these walks. One of these walks is called the Snowman's Pass in Butane, which is a tiny, is it Butane or Bhutan, Bhutan, I believe, which is a tiny nation near the Himalayan mountains. The Snowman's Pass takes at least 20 days to complete. And even the most experienced hikers say that about 50% of the people complete it, only 50%. The other most challenging walk in the world is the Kalalu Valley in Hawaii. This trail winds through jungles, under waterfalls and through steep, narrow passageways that are so dangerous that no guide will accompany you on this trip. If you choose to tackle the Kalalu Valley Trail, you'll have to walk it alone. Now, I hate to disagree with world travelers and endurance athletes, but I think the hardest walk any person will ever take is the walk mentioned in our Bible passage this morning. Walking in the way of love. Walking in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the believers in Ephesus to teach them in practical terms how to be the church. But how do you describe something that is brand new, that has never existed before? The early church was made up of rich and poor persons, Jews and Gentiles, slaves and free folks, men and women. They were confronting centuries of prejudice and cultural differences, people who were completely divided by ethnicity, race, class, and gender were coming together to create a brand new, never before, never seen movement. You had descendants of the tribes of Israel, the Benjamites. You had the Moabs, or Moabites rather, the Cushites who were descendants of Cush out of Ethiopia. You had non-Jewish Samaritans. You had other Gentiles who were Arabic or Canaanites. And imagine how these new believers felt when they understood Paul's background. <laughs> Put Paul in the mix, it's like, whoa, what's going on here? You see, before Paul became a Jesus follower, he was a member of the prominent Jewish sect called the Pharisees. The name Pharisee means the separate, separated one. Pharisees separated themselves from the people around them by their religious devotion. And Paul's commitment to the Pharisees drove him to persecute those who followed Jesus. 
even to the point of participating in the martyrdom and the murder of a believer named Stephen. So when Paul speaks about the life-changing radical love of Jesus, people sit up and listen. Is that Paul? Is that the persecutor? Is that the fierce Paul? And Paul is making the point in this passage that their commitment to Jesus doesn't set them apart from others. In fact, he says, Jesus followers will be known by how well they live in community with other people. If you were in Paul's shoes, how would you get this diverse group to envision a whole new way of life? Paul did it pretty simply by pointing them to Jesus Christ. He wrote, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly beloved children and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. You see, basically, he pointed to three kinds of ways that we show the love of Christ. First of all, walking in the way of love requires an act of love. In Jesus, life love, in Jesus rather, life love was a life, let me say that again. Let me put my words together. In Jesus's life, come on. <laughs> Love was a verb, not an action. Love was an action and not an emotion. Love was a verb, not a noun rather. It was an action, not an emotion. I'll get it straight eventually. You know, <laughs> when them brain freeze things at what, 11.35 on Sunday morning. <laughs> In Jesus' life, love was a verb, not a noun. It was an action, not an emotion. Remember, Jesus did not say, if you love me, tell me so. Rather, he said, if you love me, what? Feed my sheep. In other words, he told you to do something and not just think something. Love is an action, not just an emotion. It's an emotion too, but it's more than that. Almost a hundred years ago, there was a Scottish pastor by the name of George Morrison who preached a sermon on the subject of unconscious ministries. He said that, that other people watch what we do more than what we say. They watch what we do more than what we say. story first told by the author Ron Lee Dunn. It's a story of two altar boys, one born in 1892 in Eastern Europe, the other just three years later in a small town in Illinois. Though they lived separate lives in very different parts of the world, these two altar boys had identical, identical experiences. Each boy was given the opportunity to assist the parish priest in the service of communion. While handling the communion cup, they both accidentally spilled some of the wine on the carpet around the altar. There, the similarity in their stories ends. The priest in the Eastern European church, seeing the purple stain, slapped the altar boy across the face and shouted, clumsy oaf, Leave the altar. The little boy grew up to become an atheist and a communist. His name was Marshal Joseph Tito, dictator of Yugoslavia for 37 years. The priest in the church in Illinois, upon seeing the stain near the altar, knelt down beside the boy and said, it's all right, son. You, you'll do better next time. You'll be a fine priest for God someday. That little boy grew up to become the much beloved Bishop Fulton J. Sheen. Mullen writes, there is the gospel. When you look at these two stories, we are drawn not by wrath and condemnation, but by love. 
God is love. God draws us by love. You know, the story that you heard about David, that was an example of someone who was loved despite their failures. That's an example of God's love and God drawing us by love. And in line with that, we draw others by the love we show more than the love we describe. I think you heard the story about the young man who said, who told his girlfriend, oh, I love you. I love you. I love you from the top of the mountain to the bottom of the valley. I love you as wide as the oceans from one ocean to the other. I love you across all nations. I love you. I love you. I love you. And the young woman was so pleased. She was just flattered. She said, okay, well, come by and see my parents tomorrow. He said, well, honey, I got something to do tomorrow. And so I won't be able to see you. We draw others by the love we show more than the love we describe. Our attitudes and actions have a tremendous influence on those around us, even if we don't realize it. By remaining faithful in hard times, by choosing our attitude, by humbling ourselves in a culture that glorifies self-promotion, by choosing to walk in the way of love, we are exercising an unconscious ministry that causes others to experience the presence of God in us. To accomplish this may require us to undergo a radical transformation, to operate by the premise that love is an action not just words and not just an emotion. When God reached out to us, he didn't do it in words. He did it through the life of Jesus Christ. How did Christ live? He went out into the community, into fields, into marketplaces and synagogues and homes to meet people where they were. By some estimates, Jesus walked over 3,000 miles during the three years of his ministry. He wasn't waiting for people to come to him, he went to them. He was always going out to preach and teach and heal and spend time with people. He put his faith into action and walked in the way of love. And that's exactly what we're called to do, to demonstrate an act of faith. Not, and we're not talking about standing on corners and preaching or proclaiming what we believe, but showing our beliefs, but there's more. Walking in the way of love requires a consistent, consistent love in the Bible. This is referred to as steadfast. It refers to love that is reliable and unchanging. Now the Christian life would be much easier if God would let us define love any way we wanted to. Do you agree? I mean, after all, we want to define love in terms that are conditional, love in terms of what is emotional or circumstantial. You see, conditional love says, I will love you if, or I will love you when. Conditional love says, you're not lovable yet. You got to earn my love. Once you meet my standards, then you get my love. I mean, it would be so much easier if God let us define love the way it really, we think it should be. Once you meet my standards, then you get my love. I've seen this message implied in how some churches and church folks treat people. You gotta believe what I believe or else I can't, I can't connect to you. I can't love you. I can't reach out to you. That's conditional love. Emotional love says, I will love you until my feelings change. Until I no longer get that spark when I see you. Until you make me angry or disappoint me. Then, Circumstantial love says, I will love you until our circumstances change, until you can no longer wine and dine me, or forget about those wedding vows 
for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, for in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part. Forget about all that. Con circumstantial love says, I will love you until our circumstances change. Conditional love, emotional love, circumstantial love. Conditional love says, I will love you until that love requires any sacrifice on my part. And then I'm out the door. But God's love, you see, as demonstrated through Jesus Christ is steadfast, it's unconditional, it's everlasting. People will experience the presence and love of God when they see us walk in the way of love and in the footsteps of Christ consistently. There's an old story of four religious scholars who were debating about their favorite translation of the Bible. One of them liked the King James Version. One of them liked the Good News Version. One of them liked the translation by a prominent German theologian. The last scholar spoke up and said, I personally prefer my mother's translation. The other scholars were amused by this statement until the man said, she translated each page of the Bible into life. It is the most convincing translation I ever saw, not heard, saw. I like my mother's translation of the Bible. Walking in the way of love and, and in Christ's footsteps requires an act of love. Walking in the way of love requires a consistent love. And finally, walking in the way of love requires a sacrificial love. Oh, oh, that word sacrifice, we don't want to hear that. Lord, let us define love like we want to. Don't tell us anything about sacrifice. But verse five and chapter two of Ephesians reads, or chapter five, verse two of, of Ephesians says, walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. A fragrant offering refers to grain, animals, or incense that was burned on an altar to honor God. Now we know that no one consulted a bull or the dove before killing it on the altar. The sacrifice didn't get a vote in the matter, you see. But Jesus could have had a vote in how his story would end. He knew that he would die for the sake of people who hated him, people who rejected him, people who abandoned him. Yet he chose to be a sacrifice for us to show us just how much God loves us. And sacrificial love has been breaking open hearts and changing lives and bringing people to God for over 2,000 years. There's a mission organization in Grass Valley, California called Christian Encounter Ranch. It's a residential counseling program for young people who come from backgrounds of substance abuse, abandonment, neglect, and many forms of abuse and trauma. Through outdoor activities, Bible studies, counseling, and caring relationships, many young people find healing from their trauma and a new life full of hope and purpose. Almost 40 years ago, the board and staff of Christian Encounter Ranch came up with a unique way to raise funds for their ministry. They sponsor an annual 24 hour bicycle ride on the last weekend of July. It consists of 24 hours of bike riding through challenging nature trails in the hottest part of the summer in California. It's no surprise that the unique fundraiser is named the Agony Ride. Every year, the Agony Ride raises thousands of dollars for ministry at the ranch. McKenna Kusaw is a former resident at the ranch. Now she participates in the annual Agony Ride. She says, 
I struggled with feeling loved. I struggled with being seen and, and being seen as important when I came to Christian Encounter Ranch as a student. During my first agony ride experience, I was amazed that complete strangers who didn't know me or the other students would put themselves through complete, well, <laughs> agony in order to make sure that we could experience the healing we needed and could feel the love of Christ from being in community. Now, she says, I ride to show current students that they are not alone, that someone cares about their healing and that they are deeply loved. The executive director at Christian Encounter Ministries, Nate Boyd says, many of our residents have wrestled their whole lives with a haunting question. Does anyone actually care about me? The agony ride, he says, answers this with physical, indisputable evidence. It stirs up hope that life may be worth living after all, and it provides the means to pursue that hope. I doubt if any of us could ride the agony ride. But in our passage for today, Paul, however, invites us to walk the agony walk, the walk Christ made to cross, to the cross in our behalf. You can invite people to church. You can study your Bible. You can participate in community ministries. You can do all kinds of things to tell people that you are a follower of Jesus. But if you walk in the way of love, if you follow in his footsteps, you won't have to tell them. They will know by your active love. What's that song? They will know you are Christians by your love, by your steadfast love, by your sacrificial love, by your active love. You may not realize it, but you are surrounded every day by people who are silently asking the question, does anyone actually care about me? And if you choose to walk in his footsteps, to walk in the way of love, then your words, your actions, and your attitudes will serve as physical, indisputable evidence that there is a God whose love for them is unconditional, consistent, and sacrificial. This is the kind of love that's been changing lives for over 2,000 years. You can offer hope and healing to a world that is broken and struggling. And it all starts with your commitment to follow in his footsteps. May the peace of Christ dwell with you and let the people of God say, Amen. We share with you our time of joy and concerns. Again, we wish our joy to Nietzsche and Lee. Let's, let's, um, I'll, get the, I'll get it right. Leets. Well, I guess I didn't get it right. Okay. <laughs> we wish you our, our congratulations. We also say congratulations to Mary and Greg Whited, who will have a birthday tomorrow. And we say happy birthday to her. We continue to lift up in prayer those who are listed on our prayer list. Arya Cho, Mary Coleman, Mr. Henry Robinson, Carmen Henry, Mr. Blaine Shaw, Winifred Bean, Kathleen White, Sharon Johnson, my sister Geraldine Tate. We offer a prayer of concern for, again, the growing number of unvaccinated persons who are falling victim to the Delta strand of COVID-19, which is increasing by alarming numbers each day. Just heard a news story. I think it was this morning about a baby. I think the baby was um, 18 months old and in Texas, 
went to, had COVID-19, took her to the hospital and the hospital was full of pediatric cases. They had to put the baby on a helicopter and take her 150 miles away in order for her to be treated. So, you know, I heard one man on the, uh, on the, on the uh, news who said, I am not gonna mask up my children every day to send them to school. People, if we work together, we can get through this. So we lift each one up in prayer as they work through these issues and these things that keep us struggling with this whatever that's gone on for our 18 months now. Let us, as the people of God, join together in prayer. Oh God, we give you thanks for the household of faith. Your authority establishes, your promise gives it assurance of your abiding presence. Your messenger, Jesus Christ, calls us to live as its members. Your spirit pervades and enlivens it. So Lord, we give you thanks for this household of faith. Not just this one, but the entire household of faith. That we are connected to across the world, across this country, across the street. We give thanks for those who have lived before us as heirs of your goodness. They've passed on their vision to us. From them, we receive examples of faithfulness as they responded to Christ's teaching. Through the ancestors and through those who have gone on before, Lord, we are aware of your comfort during times of trial and temptation. Because of those who have proceeded before us, we face boldly the times that await us, led by their insight and their examples and upheld by their courage. As Christ calls us and names us, we seek to follow the example of those who have been loyal and devoted to you. So our Lord, look with favor upon us as we offer our individual prayers. As we name in our hearts, family and friends, classmates, families of those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. I lift before you my classmate, the family of my classmate, Dion Linton, as they grieve her loss on yesterday. Lord, make us more conscious of those who yearn to hear your word. Make us more conscious of those who need to hear our prayers, of those who need to be comforted by us, of those who need to have that encouraging word from us. Make us more conscious of those who seek direction for sometimes their aimless lives. Let us be for them the clear call to commitment, a source of hope and meaning in the midst of change and dislocation. Lead us together to new respect for the mysteries of faith that defy easy comprehension and marginal discipline. Guide us, O oh Lord, in our probing to be confronted and that sense of your grandeur and our own limited existence. And through it all, Lord, help us to follow in the footsteps of not only the saints, 
who dwell internally at, in your throne of grace, but to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. May the course that we follow and the lessons that we've learned lead us to becoming better ambassadors of the one who saves us, the one who taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, how would be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and glory forever. Amen. Let us close this time of worship with a song of commitment. A song that simply says, I have decided to follow Jesus, to follow in his footsteps, to follow in the way of love, to follow wherever he leads. Let us stand. which you all share. In humility, gentleness, and patience, speak only what is true and loving, and so grow into the unity that is ours in Christ Jesus. And may God, the creator, reshape your hearts. May Christ Jesus, the bread of life, sustain you always. And may the Holy Spirit unite you in the bond of peace. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, let the people of God say, Amen. Amen.
go in peace. We invite those of you who are online to unmute yourselves and to activate your video and have a time of fellowship. Go in peace. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Oh, good, good morning, morning, Loretta. Good morning, Jackie, Jim. Nice to see everyone. It's always a pleasure. Good morning. Good morning, Vera. Okay. How are you? Good morning, Vera. Okay. Good morning, Loretta. Hi. How good are morning, you? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Hello. Good morning. Good morning, Emma. Hi, Hi ladies. Hey. Always wonderful to see you. Yes. yes. God bless. I look forward to it. See all your smiling faces. Thank you. <laughs> Every week. Yes. Yes. So keep safe. Have a blessed week. Okay. You. Same to you, Loretta. Blessings hey. to all. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's Pastor Tate. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Esther. Hi, Edna. I know you're listening. Hi, Sarah. Yes, I'm listening. Okay. Hey, Edna. Hey, hey, Edna. Hey. I wish you all the best. Thank you. Same to, to you. Thank you. Keep I'm well. doing okay. <laughs> Good. Bye bye now. Thank you. <laughs> have bye -bye. a wonderful day. Bye bye. Thank you. You all have a wonderful day, too. Okay. Same Blessing to you. Thank you, everybody. Bye.